Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm going to start right away to leave uh, room for questions. So this talk is about how to make DSP programming a little bit more open source friendly than it used to be. So uh, the plan is, is that I'm going to uh, self-introduce myself and my company just briefly. Then I'm going to overview the Linux audio stack for those who don't know it. Um, then I'm going to talk about extensor hi-fi extensions, which are DSP extensions, DSP extensions used by, uh, by the firmware on your laptop, pr most probably. And then I'm going to talk about how to fit it into Clang infrastructure and LLVM. And specifically, I'm going to talk about vector data types and some challenge implementation challenges. And then a Q&A session. So, Short introduction, uh, my company is based in Krakow, Poland. We do low-level stuff, FPGA drivers, uh, network o um, OS porting, uh, networking. So myself, I'm mostly a former network expert. I say former because right now I'm, uh, I'm doing the compilers, but I used to do quite a lot of network programming and network interface drivers. Um, we usually cooperate with uh, big tech companies when they need some support in bringing up their SOCs or, uh, er, or other hardware. And this work is actually sponsored by one of them, this, the guy, the gentleman on the left, lower left here. So Google is sponsoring this effort, although I don't, don't, don't represent Google here, I represent my own company. Uh, just for the, just, this is a, a little bit of disclaimer. Uh, so the Linux, now we let's come to the details. The Linux audio stack, this is a simplified picture, so it's not, uh, it's got not as much details I would like to, but, I, but it at least fits on one slide. So the Linux uh, audio stack is present on most uh, mobile computing platforms like PCs, laptops, and Chromebooks. It's present on both on x86 and ARM V8 platforms. So if somebody has an ARM V8 Chromebook, uh, it's got the same infrastructure inside. So basically, if you want to play a sound, you've got a user space daemon that is responsible for it. It's either Pulse Audio, if this, uh, this is a regular, let's say, a movie or a, a uh, song, or if, if there is something specialized, you've got Jack Audio for low latency processing. And then there is an ISA, uh, ALSA library in the user space, which is an interface for ALSA syscalls. And then in the kernel, there is ASA subsystem and the other subsystems responsible for driving the whole thing, like DSP platform driver or codec driver. Now, on the SLC or on the, or on the PCB board, there is another SLC. It could be a part of the big SLC or, or another chip, which has a, a DSP and the audio codec, which transforms digital audio to analog or or the other way around, an analog microphone to um, sound to, to digital, right? And the DSP here um, is usually extensor, uh, extensor architecture. Um, it's responsible mostly for equalization, echo cancellation, uh, microphone boosting, uh, that kind of stuff. So any, any PC has a specific frequency response, for instance. So your speakers have specific is frequency response, which is strictly tied to your platform, and the producer, the vendor, needs to know uh, needs to know that frequency response, and then the DSP needs to adapt the, the sound to, so that it sounds nicely. Otherwise, it would be kind of dull, or I don't know, or or, or would lack a bass or whatever, right? So, uh, so that's the responsibility of the DSP. Usually, those DSPs are not uh, are around have a couple of hundred of megahertz. Uh, frequency and few megabytes of RAM. So this is that kind of, and a couple of cores. So these are usually multi-core. It could be have, could have two, three or four. Um, and on this SLC, there is a, uh, usually today you can find a sound open firmware, uh, which is an open source project. And uh, you can find it on GitHub. Um, so it used to be custom proprietary firmware, but right now vendors try to uh, converge to sound open firmware because it's easier for them. So this is a fully open source project, but the compiler that compiles this thing is not open source yet. Uh, 
the extensor architecture is kind of unique. So you've, you most probably, if you haven't programmed any DSP, you've never met such a thing before. So uh, it's a multi-core 32-bit uh, uh, CPU that has a uh, separate data path for scalar instructions and a separate data path for a vector or a floating point or any other extension instructions. Uh, the core ISA, so-called core ISA, is a scalar instructions with a scalar 32-bit registers. Um, and it's got basic arithmetics, jumps, function calls, what have you. Now, there are ISA extensions to it. And these are mostly Boolean uh, registers, floating points, specialized registers for 32-bit floating points. Hi-Fi, uh, so this is the DSP extension I'm going to talk about. And there are also baseband extensions in some chips. And usually the producer, who the vendor who wants to deploy this, uh, this uh, DSP tech, they buy a license from Cadence, because right now it's, it used to be Tensilica, right now it's Cadence. And the license allows them to produce their own version of a chip, and they can kind of point and click or configure the chip uh, and add some features or remove some features if they like. And, and they can even create their custom instructions that are not present in other architectures. So, uh, so they have got quite a lot of, so they can tweak it a lot to their liking. And that also presents a unique challenge for, for the implementer later on, for, for compiler people, for instance. Um, so each of the chip has a unique configuration, uh, but they are similar to each other. Um, so the HiFi extension uh, is a VLIV par, um, extension. So basically the core ISA is a scalar, scalar ISA, which has either 16-bit or 24-bit uh, instructions. But you can have an extension which has 64 bits uh, for, for an instruction, and those big instructions are divided into so-called slots. A slot is a single operation. Uh, so you can have three or from one up to five slots in a encoding. There are actually up to 10 encoding formats for the slots. I displayed only two for reference. Um, so this is variable encoding, you've got variable instruction sizes, and you've got variable number of operations inside, inside an instructions. Uh, most of these extensions are SIMD oriented, so they use SIMD uh, registers, they use saturation arithmetics, which is popular in DSP world, uh, multi multiply, uh, multiply accumulate, uh, there are fixed point operations, so fixed point numbers, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about them. Uh, circular buffer support, efficient looping, so uh, extra instructions that uh, make it easier for programmer to make efficient loops. So, you know, those processors, if we go back one slide, uh, they are usually, uh, they don't have any out-of-order execution engine or any kind of instruction scheduler inside. So your big application processor usually has it. So the programmer that programs an Intel or ARM CPU that's running on your laptop or in your phone, doesn't have to worry that much about instruction scheduling. So which instruction goes first, which second, and so forth. Because this is automatically scheduled by the CPU. Those smaller CPUs are uh, power efficient, and that means that all of the burden is shifted to programmer, actually, and compiler. So you can, uh, the closest to this thing would be for, for a, it uh, would be Itanium, for instance, although Itanium is a high-end, used to be high-end server architecture, but that's the similar paradigm to Itanium. So the registers, uh, the SIMD registers are 64-bit, and they can be, they have several data types inside, several flavors, so it could be one 64-bit integer, could be two 32-bit integers, could be floating points like uh, four 16-bit floating points or two 32-bit floating points. There are legacy data types, for instance, 24-bit data types that are zero extended to 32 bits when loaded into the register, um, and fixed points as well. Um, the fixed point number is a number that is divided into a fraction and a uh, integer part, similarly to floating point, but the floating point contains only a fraction and the exponent. And here you've got the fraction and the integer part. And if you multiply them, the multiplication must cut the lowest, lowest bit, which is as opposing to regular multiplication, which, which usually cuts the highest bits after the multiplication. So that's the difference. 
uh, between multiplying fractional numbers and uh, integers. So that's why fractional numbers needs a special instruction and a special data type. Uh, there are also Boolean registers. Uh, these are help. These are these are working like predicates or selectors. I, I'm going to show you a code snippet with that. There is a floating point register file, although it's optional because some configurations use the SIMD register as a floating point carrier, and some of them use a regular floating point register file. There are also kind of another additional uh, weird registers like the register that would help with all non-aligned load stores because those DSP cannot do that automatically like your application processor does. Uh, and there are let's say also kind of weird thing which is extended precision register for when your arithmetic doesn't fit into 64 bits. I'm not going to talk about that one but just for reference there are many many weird things. Uh, I mean, unusual to a regular uh, programmer, I would say. Um, now, how to program that beast? So, uh, usually, uh, programmer, like general purpose programming means that you rely on the compiler to do the job for you, right? So, you, you write your high-level so-called C code or Rust or whatever, Java, and then the compiler or JIT is supposed to select the optimal instructions for you. Now, this is a different world. So it's a programmer responsibility to choose an instruction uh, and to make it efficient. Now the compiler's work is to make it optimally encoded. So select the optimal encoding and by optimal I mean the smallest possible. So for instance, if, if the instruction could be fit into scalar and it makes sense, then fit it to scalar because it's smaller. Uh, if it cannot be fit into scalar, it goes to VLIV and then it, the compiler needs to select on which slot it goes, tries to optimize it that much. You know, one of the issues of VLIV uh, architectures is that if you have not enough work to do, some of those slots are empty, are becoming uh, non-operations, right? So uh, you have to stuff as much as possible to those slots, but it depends on the algorithm. If it's a numerical algorithm, that's usually easy. If it's like sequential uh, algorithm with a lot of branches, that usually means that all those slots are empty. Um, so uh, the way you program it is each instruction has a macro in the, uh, in the header, in the C header. There's a macro which represents the instruction. The macro is translated to the built-in function. So each C compiler has a lot of built-in functions. Usually you do them if you do some special stuff, like for instance, atomic operations in C, in C compiler are represented as a built-in uh, functions or some kind of weird bit uh, manipulations. And there are quite a lot of built-in functions which are architecture specific. So the built-in function then gets translated into an instruction in the backend. Now the, the power of the built-in function is that it works like a poor man's template. So basically it's a template implemented inside the compiler front-end. It means that the implementer can do, let's say, a constant check. You can expect from the built-in function to accept, let's say, a constant as a parameter, an only constant, and you can check it in compiler, in your compiler which is not possible in regular C code and reg or with the regular C function. Uh, so that's a kind of a magic that is allowed for a comp compiler implementer, but it's not allowed for a C programmer as opposed to C++, right? Um, and there are around 800, 800 macros for Hi-Fi Free Standard, for instance. So there's quite a lot of those uh, instructions. So this is a snippet of the code. This code converts from sign 16 to floating point, uh, converts an array or array of shorts basically to an array of floats. And as you can see, uh, it's just a regular C code with some macros, like this one, which is just loading the 60, uh, loading a SIMD vector of six, four 16-bit integers into a sample variable. This is the address, the in variable is an address, this is a constant, this is the size of is always a compile time constant, so not a problem. Um, then there is a float conversion instruction, so it converts from the integer to the float, and then there is a store, uh, store operation that stores this float value to this address, and again this is a constant uh, offset. Um, 
So the problem with that compiler ecosystem is that today the only option for DSP hi-fi section is a proprietary compiler supplied by Cadence. And it works very well, but it's proprietary, it means that it's got, it's got quite restrictive licensing. So, so basically only the vendors are allowed to compile it this day. Uh, and it cannot really keep up with the open source tools. So for instance, the, 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 I think the most recent that I've seen was based on Clang by at 3.8. So there's an older compiler that is not compliant with Clang and the new one is based on Clang, but it's free or based on 3.8 and they're not willing to open source it right now. Um, there, are also, there is also GCC and binutils, uh, but it supports core ISA only, so no DSP extensions. Uh, the good thing about them is got very good instruction scheduler built into GNU assembler. And there's Clang, that the Clang status is that the patches of Core ISA are, are done by Espressive. This is company that producing ESP32 chips, mostly for Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. And it depends on GNU binutils to do linking, but anyway, it's it it works on ESP. It works on ESP32, but this is kind of a, like a lower end processor that is not present in uh, sound cards. Uh, so my uh, my goal was to sponsored by Google Chrome team was to uh, take this uh, scalar instruction patches uh, and then extend them with the HiFi extensions. Uh, in order to make it possible for everybody to compile sound open firmware into into the uh, into, uh, into a binary form and then load it to the, to the sound card. Uh, so one of the use cases would be to have a massive co uh, continuous integration infrastructure that could test those builds, uh, you know, either on hardware or on emulator or whatever. But anyway, in order to test it, you need to compile it, which is not possible without a license and license server, for instance. Um, Usually, license is either uh, locked to a node or uh, or it's, uh, it needs a license server, right? Uh, so that's uh, one of the use cases. Um, and anyway, it's an open source project, the sound of performer, so it's kind of weird that it cannot be compiled, right? Um, so the technical goals were are to reuse the core ISA support and then extend it and rely on GNU and BNUTs for the moment because they they do a pretty good job. So the minimal viable product would, would just reuse them. So the toolchain architecture, uh, if, you, if we zoom in, usually the, the, the each compiler uh, that you can see in LLVM uh, world or even in GCC usually is split into backend and frontend. So the frontend is supposed to be uh, architecture agnostic at least in theory. So that, this is what is written in, uh, in uh, wise books, you know? And the problem is it is not. And I'll explain it in a moment. Uh, so the supposedly, supposedly architecture agnostic frontend is, uh, has a parser, then a semantic checker, then several optimizers, and then instra intermediate representation generator. And in case of LLVM, this is LLVM IR. This is just their own language that specifies their data types and operations. And this is abstract language, so it's architecture agnostic. But it's got its own type, type systems, which is by surprise, surprise, similar to the C type system. Uh, and then the backend, when it comes to LLVM, it parses this LLVM representation into a directed acyclic graph and then it goes with optimization, legalizing instructions. So it means selecting those instructions that can be implemented in the target machine or converting to other ones if they cannot be implemented in the target machine, selecting the right instructions, target specific optimizations like jumps uh, or something or, uh, uh, or call trampolines or whatever, and then machine code generation, right? And after the machine code generation, usually goes the linker uh, assembler and linker or directly or it could generate directly the machine code in binary form so you don't need to an assembler. In our case, in case of Clang support for Hi-Fi, we're going to need a GNU assembler. So the LLVM bucket would produce a, uh, a s assembly source file here and then assembly source file would be fail fed to GNU assembler. It would done uh, encoding and scheduling to VLIV and then it would go to GNU linker. 
and as you can see there are two pieces of uh, two pieces of clunk front end which happen to be um, which happen to be uh, target specific which is vector semantics and intrinsics intrinsics meaning uh, built-in functions uh, so the vector data types uh, in C compilers are not part of the ISO standard. So uh, basically, if you're writing a vector variable, it's not a C language by the by, by the strictest definition. So what the compiler implementers do, but people want to write vectors, right? They want to write simply code not only in assembly but also in C. So um, uh, so what the compiler creators came up with is is the vector extension and the first one GCC. So the GCC has an attribute vector size expression, which works as a type attribute, and it's, it extends a type to become a vector. So for instance, uh, this definition makes that you've got a short variable, but this vector size is eight bytes. So it means that there are four shorts. So this is four by, so this is a vector consisting of four items. Each of them is a 16 bit. So this one, for instance, vector size 8 uh, but it's integer so it means that there are two integers each one is four bytes in this particular architecture and so on uh, so you create such uh, you create type depths like this and then you've got your vectors now um, so this aa underscore is the naming convention used by extensa so you, you've got a lot of those so a and AA underscore in 16 by uh, X4 means that this is a 16-bit integer uh, uh, replicated four times uh, in a SIMD uh, vector and is most likely backed by a SIMD register. Um, now there are a couple of, uh, there are different vector types but it could be because you could have like F34, F32 vector which is not a floating point but a fixed point vector. So you can have uh, two kinds of integer, either regular or fractional. Uh, and it cannot be expressed in any LLVM or GNU or whatever, or C type system. So basically C programmers and LLVM uh, designer didn't envision fractional numbers as a part of their tool chain. So these are completely opaque to the compiler. The compiler doesn't have slightest idea about fractional numbers. Uh, so there are some non-standard operations that extensa compiler, uh, the proprietary extensa compiler can do, which the standard compliant, uh, compliant compiler cannot do. For instance, casting a vector to an integer. It's not allowed in GCC, not allowed in Clang today. Uh, at least hasn't been until I got into it. So, uh, uh, so um, for instance, on the upper right hand, you've got a casting operation. So you've got 16 by 4 vector and you want to cast it to an integer. The way it's done is you take just the lowest element or the first element of the vector, whatever it is, and just copy it to the regular integer and then you discard the rest. Splicing is the opposite operation when you have one integer and you want to replicate it to the whole vector. Uh, mm, Again, not supported by the standard C, exten uh, C vector extension. Um, and what it does is it produces, this is the first introduction on LLVM, uh, LLVM intermediate representation. It produces actually four LLVM instruction. So first of, them, first of them is extract element. So basically it takes, accepts the vector and then it says, okay, take me uh, the vector element number zero and just copy it to the destination. Now there's a regular addition, so I++ compiles to this one. And now there are two instructions that implement splicing. This is be because LLVM instruction set doesn't uh, envision any such a thing as splicing. They, they've got insert element, which can build a vector or insert an element into a vector, or they can, or, and they have shuffle vector instruction, which can uh, shuffle, uh, take two vectors and just exchange the items uh, between one of those two and so without going into too much details those two instructions basically implement splice and you end up if you compile it further you end up with again three machine code instructions so as you can imagine the backend optimizer is responsible for, responsible for recombining those two instructions into single machine instruction uh, so the one the first instruction is takes uh, 
This is a source register, so this is a SIMD register. The SIMD registers are called AAD and the number. Usually there are 16, 16 of them. And, and there are 16 regular registers. So this is copying one of the items from the, the, the item number zero from the vector register to a uh, scalar register. Scalar registers are A1, A2, and so on, H0, and so on. Uh, then there is an integer addition. And then there is a uh, opposite operation, a splicing operation, which takes the scalar uh, registers and uh, replicates its contents into a vector register, this, uh, in this case four times, because it's 16 bits. And as I, uh, as I mentioned before, unfortunately, all this magic must be done in a front end, because this is an intermediate representation. So it means that it's already done, right? So whoever is doing this, it must be in the front end. Uh, and by the way, in LLVM, there are like four or five types of vector extensions. So there is a regular GNU vector extension. There's a NEON vector extension, which is uh, ARM specific. There's an ALTIVEC vector extension, which is power specific. And there are others. So uh, it means, so I took the regular as a basis for the implementation. Um, but there are others, and so it's not like it's not a very generic code. It's not a very generic way because it's not a standard. So everybody can devise its own vector extension if they like. And now Boolean data types is uh, even weirder than than the one before. So there are two Booleans. One is bool, and this is uh, this is just a regular Boolean which is usually uh, implemented uh, as eight-bit integer, and it's sits into a regular register file. It means it's sign signs extended to 32 bits. So, you know, as opposed to Intel, most other architectures don't have, don't, uh, 32-bit architectures don't have 8-bit registers. So each time you use a variable which is smaller than 32 bits, it's sign extended to 32 bits. This is what ARM is doing, uh, and this is what Power is doing, and, and RISC-V. The only exception is Intel, which has these eight bits, you know, smaller uh, smaller registers. Mm. When it comes to application processor, obviously, and that, and it's no different in DSP world. So they have thirty two bit registers, and they don't bother with implementing smaller ones. Uh, but there is another boolean which is called XTBool, and it is supposed to be backed by a boolean register file, which is one bit or it could be 2-bit vector or 4-bit vector. Uh, I mean vector consisting of 4 bits. So LLVM has, can create 4-bit vector with uh, consisting of 1-bit one, one elements or 2-bit vector or I1, which is Boolean in LLVM language. But the C language doesn't know anything about it, right? So there you cannot have a 1-bit variable in C language. There is an extension proposal in Clang. So but it's going to be just Clang-specific extension, right? Um, now, the Boolean call ABI says that you have to pass it and return it. If you call a function or you return a value from a function, which is Boolean, you must, to ke you must keep it into a general purpose register. So you cannot use Boolean register to pass the argument. Uh, and this means that each time you end the function and you begin the function, you need to begin with zero extending this to 32 bits and then trunking it back to, uh, oh yeah. So zero, uh, uh, at the entry, you need to trunk it from 32 bits to one bit. And, and the, uh, at the exit, if you want to return it, you have to again convert it from one bit to 32 bits. And guess what? There is no single instruction in ISA that can do one of those operations. So uh, actually trunking, trunking can be done by one instruction, but zero extended cannot be done. There is no instruction like that. It takes like three to four instructions to zero extend it. So it's highly inefficient. Uh, and the way, it, so the way they, the Boolean instructions are done, uh, are used is like this. For instance, this is an operation that compares a vector of two integers. Each of them is 32 bits. Uh, you compare two integers with two integers, right? So A variable is one vector, B variable is second vector. And you, end up with two bits of result. Each bit says if uh, each bit, if the bit is one, it means the, the lower, the let's say vector indices number zero are equal. Uh, uh, and the bit number two is accordingly for the vector indices, indices number one. Uh, so you've got two bit vector. Now uh, you want to have a conditional move. 
So basically, it's a, like a select operation, like a conditional operator in C. So it says, take it as a predicate, and if it's 1, then move from B to A. If it's 0, don't move it. So leave the A intact. And it's uh, parallel for each, uh, each of the vector element. Um, and it is again, now it is translated to magic. So this is LFVM magic. So each time, uh, each time you've got a built-in function, uh, well, almost each time you've got a machine-specific specific, built-in function, it is translated to LLVM built-in function, and then later, later in the instruction selection phases, you then change it into your machine instruction. So this way you can create custom instructions in C compiler that are kind of opaque for the compiler for some parts, but end up being translated into real machine instructions. And this is the case. So this function call is translated into single instruction and this function call is translated also into single instruction, which are looking similarly to those macros actually. Um, so what, what's more about it? Well, uh, so anyway, they, they, must using, they must use Boolean register. So uh, this instruction does not accept any other opcode. It must be Boolean register here and Boolean register here uh, in the second one as a source. So, so it means that you must force your compiler to use Boolean registers. So you end up having two Boolean data types, one regular and the second one a special one. And again, LLVM cannot distinguish two Boolean I1 uh, one bit types. There, is no, there are no type attributes that would say, okay, it sounds like a real Boolean, but it's not. So we have to select pick one, or either you know completely change the LLVM so it fits to extensa, or or just pick one which is uh, kind of more common or more usable, and it ends up being the real Boolean uh, register. So in my implementation, the Boolean is backed by Boolean register because it's more generic because you can use those special instructions. Now there are also other. Uh, there's other weird stuff here, so there are hidden side effects. So, you've got the operation like this, in the, and it's in the manual uh, to the extensor, and you've got output variable here passed by pointer, but you also have an in-out variable here passed by double pointer here, I mean, that's the explanation, um, which means that you 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 send the, the um, you send the input variable and then it's modified inside, right? And then there is an immediate argument, so it me means it's constant. But the macro macro is not using uh, any pointer casting here, so this is not a pointer to integer. This is just an integer, and this is also a pointer, not a double pointer, not a pointer to a pointer, but just a regular pointer. And it has to be magically translated into a built-in function, which takes those pointers. Uh, and then it's again translated into an LLVM uh, built-in function. Uh, but the LLVM built-in function doesn't use uh, doesn't use pointers here, but is just producing the new result and cast and writes the new result to the pointer variables. So this is because the real instruction cannot be represented, represented in LLVM as just a, uh, with a side effect. So basically instructions, instruction definitions in LLVM cannot have side effects. It means that cannot have, if you have, it cannot have a register which is an input and an output at the same time. If you have such a situation, you have to translate it into a dummy, like kind of virtual, op virtual operand. One is for input, one is for output. And you have to say to LLVM that these two operands are in fact one operand in machine code, but they are used in a different manner. So, so that's why we have to do this weird kind of translation. And so this is similar to a C++ reference type or a Pascal var argument, but in C language there's no equivalent. And in LLVM also. Uh, so it breaks C standard. That's, uh, so using without, if, if I didn't use this pointer, I would break the C standard. And this is what the extensor compiler is doing. If we go back to this place, so the extensor compiler doesn't modify, it doesn't use the pointer cast, uh, pointer producing operator here or uh, here. 
it would just assume to be done inside. But this is kind of cheating because it, it breaks the standard. Uh, so the way to implement it, and it's got consequences, you know, because let's say somebody is a C programmer that does a casting operator on your address, which is allowed in C. If you have a casting operator, you've got an R value. R value, by definition, is a kind of temporary value that cannot have a memory address. So basically, if you have something like this, you cannot, uh, you cannot do a pointer casting on it. So then it gets translated by the macro preprocessor to this one, and this one produces a compiler error. So that's why having a hidden side effect is a bad thing. And there's no way, there's no escape route. So the only thing to do for the open source implementation is to just not allow it and ask uh, some open firmware engineers to just not use such constructs. That's it. Uh, and the way to overcome this is, of course, to produce a new variable after the casting. And because you've got the new variable, you can take the address of the new variable. Uh, so in order to summarize it, there are a couple of challenges for such unusual architecture. So uh, we have to upstream a new vector type at some point because the hi-fi vector is not the same as GCC or we have to just abandon all the extensions that are not standard like casting and splicing and just ask the developers to stop using it. So either this or that. Uh, currently it's a hack. So basically if I see the architecture is extensor, I just use a different semantics. But when I'm going to upstream it, I cannot use that hack. Uh, so the, the, the detailed explanation of the vector extension is here on the, this address. I highly recommend it to everybody uh, who wants to use vectors in C. Fractional types, another challenge because they cannot be uh, represented in the compiler infrastructure. So they have to be completely opaque types and then no implementer can, uh, can rely on the fact that if you add two fractional types, you would have a fractional result you want. Uh, Boolean types, again, weird beast, uh, and there are departures from C standard like those side effects. So the general solution would be that, uh, so by the way, this project is kind of very close to upstreaming, so it's not upstreamed yet uh, because of those dilemmas, among other things. Uh, uh, but the general solution would be to just divide a new open source extent coding standard that is compliant with C without some, uh, without these most extraordinary extensions that, you know, cause problems for the regular compiler. Uh, and apply the new standard for the code, hopefully so that it's compatible with the extensor proprietary compiler as well. And uh, perhaps in the future, those two compilers would kind of converge. Uh, and the key takeaway from this presentation is that Standards do make our life really easier. So you, you heard it uh, yesterday on a keynote, and that's really true even for such a specific task like this one. So the, all of the pain that I had was just because the vectors was not part of the standard. And people, because it was not part of the standard, everybody did, did the vectors their own way, right? ARM people did their own way, Extensa people did their own way, and the GCC did their own way. And side effects are terrible, and that's the second thing. Um, and especially uh, I like surprising side effects that were not supposed to be there. When, this, when the language says there are no side effects, you should not introduce any side effects, right? Not, don't break the standard. Now, another takeaway is that it's not the ideal world. So CFrontend has plenty, C -frontend has plenty, plenty of architecture specific spots which has to be addressed anyway, again, because it's not part of the standard. If it was part of the standard, it would be architecture agnostic. Uh, except for built-in functions, it would still be architecture specifics because there's no way around it. If you want to use a specific instruction that is just on your architecture, you have to use a built-in function in C or in line assembly. But both uh, ways are not portable, right? So uh, either this or that. And actually, built-in function is better than inline assembly because the compiler implementer can reason about it, knows what's the operation, and, ca and it can be better optimized. Now, inline assembly is completely opaque for the uh, optimizer, so it cannot do anything with it. Mm, almost. Uh, like, uh, anyway, LLVM type system is flexible, but not flexible enough for an extensor, not good enough. 
So I'm not proposing to extend it because it doesn't make sense for singular architecture. I'm just saying that it's either, either um, even though it's kind of generic, in fact, is you know it's uh, really tied to the C type system. It blends very well with C, with C++, with Rust. But if you have something unusual like fractional number, it doesn't fit, right? So uh, and the bad thing about it is that opaque values that are not uh, cannot be reasoned about inside the compiler cannot be optimized by the compiler. So it, you could leave the opaque type, like a type that has different bits of presentation, but it can be optimized. Uh, so the last takeaway is that ISA design should, in fact, take the target language into consideration. And this is, if you think it is something, you know, uh, controversial, think about what has RISC done in the 80s. So basically, uh, the RISC architecture, one of the key design goals, if you see in the documents uh, and in the memoirs of those people, the key design goal was to make it easy for the C programmer to generate, uh, C compiler to generate code for it. So it actually makes a lot of sense to think about C programming as a like kind of common language for uh, system programming and create an architecture which is C language friendly. Um, and ABI as well. So if you design your own ISA or if somebody else in your company is designing your own, own ISA, please think about those things like, for instance, zero extending, which has no instruction in, uh, in Extensa, right? And it is obvious thing for any C compiler implementer that you need to zero extend your variables, sometimes to 32 bits. All right, so that would be the end of my part. And now I can accept, I guess, a few questions because we move to before we move to the other presentation. Extensive CPUs are usually uh, chip specific. Yes. Uh, how to mainline it? OK, so that part wasn't explained in details, but each extensa, but usually they are chip specific, but most of the real world chips that you find in your laptops or uh, yeah, laptops and Chromebooks and so etc are pretty similar so basically they can be anything but in fact they're usually quite common and if they use the extension they use like the full part of the extension so if they have those vectors registers they have all those vectors instructions the same ones uh, and they have the same encodings. Now, if somebody is newly coming to the market and producing a new version of the NS of the Extensa DSP and does some weird thing, then it's going to be incompatible. That's the problem. So we cannot like... So right now it's done this way. There's an ISA definition which is produced in a C file and the ISA definition is consumed by binutils uh, and the binutils can uh, reason about the ISA and they're all instruction encodings on all, all operand definitions. It's called overlay. overlay. If, you, if you Google Instensa overlay, it, it will show it to you. So uh, this way, each variant of the GCC compiler right now can, uh, or actually binutils, uh, may be um, compiled with a specific variant of the Extensa overlay, which is a strictly uh, processor definition, and ISA definition actually, and then it would compile for this specific processor, right? But Clang has a different assumption that you have multi-architecture frontend, which is uh, supposed to produce code for any processor whatsoever. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to list a specific CPU variants in Clang, and which is tied basically to a specific uh, DSP variant, which is on your laptop. So for instance, you've got a Canon Lake a CPU. So you're going to have a Canon Lake DSP. If you have a AMD Renoir uh, or a Mediatek CPU ARMv8, you're going to have Mediatek, uh, a Mediatek DSP. So this way I can escape this problem, but it means that any new CPU must be added explicitly to Clank. Uh, no, it wasn't. So the GCC had a, uh, in GCC it's upstreamed, so it's like higher quality, I suppose, because it's uh, already in the mainline and maintained. 
and in Extensa it was not yet accepted to the mainline. So that was patches. So I suppose there might be some bugs in there, right? Uh, but uh, so the code quality might be a little bit lower because it's not yet accepted. So people were not actively testing it, I suppose, at least uh, uh, not as many as we, when it comes to GCC. Oh yeah, I was expecting that question. That's a good one. So that was a choice of my sponsor, basically. So they preferred Clang because they are heavily relying on uh, Clang infrastructure for other projects. And if you happen to be on a C++ conference, there's quite a lot of talks about C++ and Clang done, let's say, by a, by a guy named Chandler, Chandler Caruth. And this guy is a part of ISOC board and is also a Google employer. So, so they invest heavily in uh, in Clang infrastructure, and that's why they chose this one. Yeah. Uh, in general, compiler optimization should be good, but in a technical case, it does not work right because there is a lot of special comments or syntax in, in, in the technical way. Will you try to first use the compiler optimization or? Uh, okay, so I've got. Yeah, so let me, s uh, can I answer this question offline because I have got a signal from the staff that I should stop right now. So we can talk about it uh, in a moment, all right? Thank you guys.